the, the title of this session is Framing the Schools of the Future, Best Ideas from Redesign and Other Innovation. So um, again, my name is Sarah Perryman, Redesign Coordinator at KSDE, been with the agency since 2018. So seeing this redesign project grow over these last few years. So I wanna give just a little bit of background on the redesign project uh, before we introduce our panelists for this morning. In 2015, the Kansas Board of Education uh, created the vision for Kansas that we would lead the world in the success of each student. And so we knew in order to reach that vision that we were going to have to do things differently. We were going to have to innovate and change our practices in order to help each student reach that level of post-secondary success. And so in order to think differently about how we do school, we had to ask Kansans what it is that they wanted. And from those community conversations that took place in 2015, the four redesign principles were born with those four redesign principles being that we need to intentionally develop student success skills. We need to focus on family, business, and community partnerships. We need to give students voice and choice in personalizing their learning. And we need to make sure that what we're doing in our schools with our students, that it's applicable to the real world. And so our panelists today will talk about the innovations that they have implemented in their school to leverage those four redesign principles to help them and Kansas reach that vision of helping each student find success. So the redesign uh, project has taken place over these last five years. We've had six cohorts go through the plan year where they learn those principles, the process, and the conditions necessary for reaching success. We've had 72 districts and over 190 schools engage in this work. And we know that this is just the beginning while the redesign project formally uh, is coming to a close with no new cohorts of schools, we know that the schools across Kansas that have led this work are really going to be those pioneers and models of what it means to do things differently in Kansas. And so today we have three schools here with you who were really those innovators and early adopters of redesign coming from those Mercury Gemini uh, cohorts. And so today we have J.J. Leibold, the principal of Santa Fe Trail Middle School in Olathe, Leroy Parks, principal of Chester Lewis Alternative School in Wichita, and Jared Furman, principal of Baser Linwood High School uh, in Baser, Kansas. And so I'm going to uh, just start by introducing J.J. He'll kick off our panel today. Uh, JJ, I had the pleasure of subbing in his building a couple times this past semester and really got to see him in action and really get to feel the culture that's been created in his building these last few years. So uh, Santa Fe Trail Middle School is a Mercury school. They were one of those innovative schools that kicked off the redesign project. They have focused on social emotional learning, community service, and academic excellence. And one of the things I appreciate most about JJ is that he is a servant leader. So from doing bus duty to cleaning the cafeteria, uh, recognizing students, he's really um, just demonstrated what it means to be a servant leader. And so uh, the structure of this panel will uh, spend about 20, 25 minutes hearing from our presenters, and then we'll leave about five to 10 minutes for some Q&A. If you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, if there's something that can be answered in, um, in the moment, uh, I can uh, interrupt and ask that question, or I can save those questions for the end. And with that, I will kick it over to JJ to talk to us about Santa Fe Trail Middle School and the innovations that they have um, implemented to leverage success in their building. Thank you for having me this morning. I really appreciate um, Sarah being able to sub in our building because as you know, across the state, we had a little bit of a sub shortage this year. So she did a great job helping, helping in. I appreciate the kind words. So uh, I'm just really excited to be here today. My son is, is uh, currently at KU. Um, I am a big North Carolina fan though. So just throwing that out there. So um, that, was, that was a tough one. It was good until about half for me. Um, but, you know, so this is the way it goes. So congratulations to those Jayhawks. But um, I'm just here to kind of share a few things from um, school redesign um, and excited to be here with my fellow panelists and, and just really to just share a few things and leave some time at the end for any questions that you may have. So 
I just titled this Big Ideas from School Redesign. And um, I, I want to share just a little bit of information about uh, Santa Fe Trail. We are um, kind of in the, the heart of Olathe uh, in Johnson County. And I, I think sometimes when people think about schools in Johnson County, we have this certain um, perception that all schools are the same or all schools have you know, uh, that are all uh, kind of well to do it or cer certain socioeconomic status. Um, but we are the um, highest, uh, most uh, highest impacted school in Johnson County, middle school in Johnson County, which means we have the highest number of free and reduced lunch and um, special education. We do have a approximately about 28, 26% ELL students in our, in our building uh, as well. And um, we are a, a pretty transient school. This number has dropped quite a bit over COVID, but we typically have about 100 students to move in and out during the course of the school year. So I just kind of want to share that, that, that a little bit about our school. Um, and, you know, when we took on redesign a few years ago, we were one of the first ones through the walls, as Jay Scott likes to say, and, and it was, uh, it was tough. It was, it was really tough. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really been great. Last year, we were able to, because I was on a little bit early and heard, you know, talking a little bit about the changes in, in, in education and through the pandemic. And we were able to, because we were redesigned school and because of our separate schedule that doesn't match the other middle schools in Olathe, we were able to actually create our own remote school within our school last year. Um, so we had students that were either um, that, you know, that had selected remote for the year that were seeing one teacher uh, or a, a few teachers and they were, and then the school, the students who were in hybrid um, were seeing their, their, um, their teachers every day, either remote or in person. So that was exciting to be able to do that. It was stressful, um, but we, we certainly learned a lot uh, through, through that as well. So uh, Sarah just already mentioned these, but we, we really build our schedule around what are called our three pillars. And the three pillars are academic, social, emotional learning, and civic engagement. And we really think about these as like kind of the three legs of, a, uh, of our program, our three pillars that kind of hold everything up. So we talk about our schedule and some things that I'm going to show you. They're really built around these three, these three areas. So this was our schedule from um, last year, and it will not look the same for the 22-23 school year. Um, it has not been the same schedule probably two years in a row, uh, which is exciting. Being one of 10 middle schools in Olathe, uh, we are in an incredible district, but we are only one of 10. And so I think sometimes redesign can move a little bit faster in smaller school districts than what it can maybe in a larger school district. Um, but we are fortunate in that we have the ability to change our schedule. Uh, we do not have to match the schedule of the other buildings in our district and we also do not have to share teachers which is which is pretty great um, so we all you know because our schedule doesn't match we we really can't share teachers but this is our schedule um, basically it's it's maybe similar to what you would see at a high school but we have seven period days um, and then odd and even block days and um, seven period days are typically monday wednesdays and fridays and then we do odd and even block on um, wednesdays and thursdays we start each day with a startup period, and I will talk a little bit more about that uh, here in a minute. And then when you see this WIN, W-I-N, W-Y-N stands for what I need, what you need. That is our intervention time. What we found is that a lot of the students that we needed to see, uh, you know, for remediation, reteaching, um, were not able to stay after school or come in early. So we just built that time into our school day. That time has really become where we do our 95% reading intervention, literacy and, and intervention that's now been implemented by the state. Um, and so the other time that I'll point out here and, and talk about it a little bit more is this flex time, which is on even block because we have a seven period day, we have a flex period on an even block. And that is where we really use our, um, use that time for, for several different things. And we have um, a 21st century programs in the Latha that want to come to present to our students. Um, we have some student choice during this time. We have um, our pep assemblies. We have our combined rehearsals, but really trying to provide what we look at is, is equity and opportunity for our students at Santa Fe Trail to give them experiences that they would normally not be able to get. So that's just a really quick look at our schedule. Um, and we'll talk about it here a little bit more in depth. And We'll start off with the SEL pillar, and I'm just really going to hit on like one or two things for each one of these because of because of time and 
and um, Leroy knows that I like to talk, so I'm going to try to <laughs> make sure that that I give enough time for, for everybody. But um, our SEL pillar really uh, starts with Cyclone Startup. And we do that every day. And the why behind startup really was that we were seeing uh, students coming to school and not necessarily ready to learn right away when they got to school. Um, we were also seeing students that maybe were being dropped off late or coming in late. And we're not we're a middle school, so students are not driving themselves. So we're working with parents and working with students to get here on time, of course. But we really said, you know, when a student comes in late and their first hour of the day is math or language arts or any any class really that first 10 to 12 minutes of class is so important um, you know that's when students are more more ready to learn and when they're coming in late and the teacher has to stop and start and and students are are, are missing that period of time we said what if we take that away um, so we may still have students that come in late but they're not late for core class they're not late for instruction and so we start off um, every day even on our block days with startup and this is just a little bit of a schedule of, of what that would look like so we have what kind of our, our must do may do list for teachers um, and this shows you just a little bit of a sample of kind of a team schedule from from day to day of of what we do we do our signups um, typically on fridays for our flex and win sessions um, I do a video now that's that's not included in this this schedule, but I do a video every Monday for the kids as well to kind of start the week that they that they will watch. And we do implement second step lessons at Santa Fe Trail and through the uh, through the Olathe School District. Uh, so you'll see kind of the collective commitments are our must do's, and then our may do's are additional things that teachers are you know can and, and do in, during that time as well. Uh, we run this with what are called extended teams. So an extended team means that we have our four core teachers and then three to four elective teachers that make up that extended team. Those teachers um, may not have all those students, but they have all the students for startup. So they have that same group and we have um, six uh, extended teams at Santa Fe Trail. Our civic engagement pillars is really focused around three areas. And the first one is RSVP, which is student council, but really a more structured student council. It's through the National Association of Secondary School Principals. And um, it's been great. Uh, we've been able to see a lot more uh, student um, voice. And we, we talk a lot about student voice and choice. One thing that came out of this, this RSVP program is that I've been able to meet with a group of students about once every two weeks or so that are my principal's advisory council. So they will come in on typically Monday mornings and I ask them basically four questions of what are we doing well? What do we need to be doing differently? What could teachers be doing to help students and what could um, students do to help their school? Um, it's really great to get their insight from those students um, on, a, on a weekly basis. Um, I've also, through this program, really started to work with um, shadowing students, where I will try to take a day and just become a student and follow a student for a day, which is really an interesting experience, especially in math class for me. Um, so I, I might try to sneak out to the nurse's office during that time or something like that um, uh, during, during that class. But it's been, a, it's been a great, great experience to actually sit there with a student um, and go through the entire day, including lunch and, and that type of thing. We, we call ourselves a school of service. We ask that each student at SFT complete a one hour service requirement. And um, they do that through, they, they log that through a program called Zello, which used to be called Career Cruising. Um, and we recognize uh, students for their, for their service um, hours as well. Um, and then finally, probably one of the, the coolest things that we do is our, our, the uh, exploration days. Um, and expiration days are basically, we did four of those um, a year. We're taking it down to two because of kind of the way our calendar is falling. But it's basically where we take the entire day. Um, it's usually on a Friday. It's usually before a break. Um, and we take the entire day and students get to sign up for what we call orbits. And we either do a 45 minute or about an, an 80, 90 minute session, uh, depending on if it's a simple or complex um, these are some of the things that students can sign up for. These, this is the most recent one that we did here in April. Uh, so we had American Sign Language, which was, um, which was awesome. I got to go in, in, in there and, and uh, watch the kids learn uh, American Sign Language. Um, we, had, uh, we are building a new building, which is exciting here that will be opening up in two years. 
Um, and we had some uh, students that were uh, going down and revitalizing the, the girls' locker rooms. Uh, so this was one of our service projects orbits. Um, we had, oh, those are two, two examples of what we've done. With other things that we've done in the past is uh, one of the first years that we did this, we brought in Vietnam veterans um, with a Huey helicopter um, and had that in our parking lot. And they got to tour that. And then we had our culinary class um, actually provide the, the lunch for those, for those veterans as well. So these are examples a little bit about our expiration days, which have been really popular. Um, and the kids uh, sign up for these. Uh, our attendance on these days is typically really, really high. Um, and the kids try to get in early to sign up for the orbits that they want to attend. They are driven by teacher, um, teacher interest, but also we, take, we survey the students after to see what students want to do. I can tell you anything that has to do with animals and service projects for animals and dog shelters and or pet shelters and things like that are very, very popular as well. And then our academic pillar, um, I talked briefly mentioned a little bit about flex, but students um, have uh, on an even block day, they're, they're broken up into two 40 minute sessions and students have three choices. Um, they can either be pulled by a teacher for combined rehearsals, tests, makeups, clubs, and so on. Um, or they can sign up for, for an open elective. So it might be art, writing, movement, um, board games, um, typically things that do not require technology. Um, we're trying to kind of give students a break from screens. And then we also offer some core sessions like homework help, um, silent sustained reading. And then I mentioned that we, this is when we do our PEP assemblies, our 21st century program meetings. Uh, this has really been great because the way that our building is set up, we are not, um, our, our band room, for example, is not large enough to, to, take, to have a combined rehearsal for all of our band students. So when they need to practice before a concert, um, they can do that during flex. And um, when we, before we put in flex in place, we had, I think, 32 different times in one school year where students were being pulled from classes to do things like that, combined rehearsals and things like that. After we implemented flex, we had two that we were not able to fit into flex time. So this has been a really, a really great program for us. We get, like I said, we get a, a several folks that want to come in and talk to our kids, and we really make sure that that happens during this time. So that is pretty much what I what I have. I know that was fast, and those are those are uh, three three really uh, things that we're doing differently that we didn't do prior to redesign and. And just what I would say about school redesign, I think as I was listening to the session before that's, that's, that's different is that school redesign is, is a grassroots effort. Um, it is um, a reform movement, but it happens within your school. And so redesign does not look the same um, in, in every single building. And I think you're gonna hear that today. And, and really what's, what's great about it is that, um, you know, it really levels and, and flattens out the leadership structure um, within a building. So I do not make all the decisions and the district does not make all the decisions. It really comes from the voice of, of our teachers and needs of our students and our student voice and, and choice as well. So thank you for having me. And, and that is that is my part of the presentation. Thanks, Sarah. Well, thanks so much, JJ. Um, I really appreciate how you've embraced that empathized step of the design thinking process and how you've continued to leverage that and use that as a way to, con to continue to have that ear to the ground of, of what's really happening so that you can be responsive to the needs of your, of your staff and students. There was one question that came through in the chat that I wanted to um, bring to you that comes from uh, Maria. She said, bravo, Mr. Leibel. I subbed in your building about five years ago while pursuing a job in Kansas again. Question, you have a significant percentage of Hispanic students who culturally value community and often do not focus on their low SES. I taught in a 95% free reduced bilingual school in Chicago for a decade. How much do you think this affected your turnaround efforts? You know, I, one thing that I didn't talk about uh, that's been a, a really, uh, you know, uh, unintended consequence, I guess, or just uh, some things with, with redesign is that when you're in a redesign school, you also kind of get permission, so to speak, to try a lot of different things. Um, and so one of the things that we did about three years ago is, is that we went from a sheltered model in ELL to a push-in model. Um, and so 
our students are pushed in and they're pulled back almost like a special education class for just one period a day. Um, and we're really working on that co-teach piece of what co-teaching truly looks like in, in that system. Um, and I can tell you just as a, a side benefit of that is that um, our, our students are feeling more connected to school when they were sheltered for a majority of the day and then pushed out for one class. They did not, they did not feel um, that they were part, part of the school as much as they could have. And, and we've, we're seeing so many more students that are getting involved in things like um, RSVP, but not only that, sports and, and um, music and drama and things like that across the board. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question, but one of the things that we, we really try to do uh, with our community as well is, is uh, everything that goes out goes out in Spanish. Um, I have a newsletter that I do in Spanish as well. Um, we're working hard at making sure that our site council, which is our parent group, is more representative of our, of our school. And so really doing whatever we can to reach out to, to all families, all families in our community. Thanks, JJ. Another uh, question that came through said, I would be very interested in hearing more about your list of examples, choices for exploration days. Okay, um, try to go through some of them that we do. Um, when, we have a, when we have what's called a, um, a complex orbit, which is when we take basically like a double orbit, we will take field trips. And we've been really lucky to get some grants uh, from because this redesign is supposed to be a zero, um, a zero, not zero funded because you have to fund it. But basically, it's not supposed to cost you anything, but it does. Because um, when we offer things like this and we're offering field trips, we've been able to get some nice grants. But we've taken kids um, on field trips to the Negro Leagues Museum, to the Jazz Museum. We, we took a field trip one year to the water treatment facility. Um, here in here in Olathe, um, so the students could find out a little bit about the water cycle, where their water comes from, and that process. Um, we've been able to take students to opportunities that they wouldn't normally get. Uh, we've been able to bring in um, uh, parents in our community, and they've been able to present a little bit about their culture and where they come from. Um, so. That th those are just a few examples. Um, I'm trying to think of some. I, I know that that our our rescue dog at home received a snuff blanket. Some kids made some snuff blankets, which are apparently good for dogs. I guess um, she's kind of torn it up. I don't think she used it for what it was supposed to be used for. But anyway, she had fun with it for a while. Um, so things like that that you know really trying to give back. We have some really good partnerships with our with our feeder elementary school. So we've been able to send students over there to read to students, to do community service, to help with their field days. Uh, so really it's, it's kind of an example of all those things. And if, if anybody wants, you know, maybe some, some more ideas on what to do, just, you know, um, contact Sarah there, send me your email address and I'll be happy to send you kind of the PowerPoint and the structure of what we do um, through expiration days. That sounds great. There's one question I wanted to uh, bring to you. Uh, what is one key learning from redesign that you think all schools could take and apply? Oh boy, um, I really think what what has changed for me is is providing probably more student voice and choice. I think that would be one of the key components. I mean, there's been several lessons learned through redesign, but. One of the first things that we did when we, we started this process is we had a student summit um, where we asked students questions and we didn't pull you know, all the, the, the students that were you know, A-plus students in the building. We got a cross-section of students and we, we did a student summit that was led by some of our, our AIM or AVID leaders in the building. And they really asked students, what did they want to see in their school? And the thing that came out loud and clear was student voice and choice. And they wanted more choice over their day. They wanted more voice in, in their activities and what they were doing. And we've really taken that to heart. Our mission statement is empowering all learners to explore. And we spent a lot of time with that. And really that idea that all means all with it within your building. So I would say that would be the, the, the thing that, that has come forward. And then, and then absolutely, you have to have really a powerful staff that is willing to step up and lead because one administrator, one teacher, one BLT chair cannot do all this work. It's too much. 
Um, so you have to have people in your building that are that are able to do that. Um, so I think those are the things that that have come forward. And then as far as administrator, if there are administrators on this, the the, the last thing I would say is completely change the way I hire teachers, and which has been great. So when I hire teachers now, I will send them the basics of our school redesign program. And if they are not able to speak to that, and they're not able to talk about how they can deliver an SEL lesson or uh, they're not interested in exploration days or doing things beyond what they're doing, then, then it's a, it can be a pretty quick interview. Um, so it's, it's really changed the way that I hire. And, and I've been here long enough to where you're, the hiring of, of teachers, really they are bought in when they get here and we do not have to kind of get them on board. They're already on board because we've hired them with redesign in mind. Another question that came uh, up in the chat is, I'd like to learn more about the engagement of students during the first few minutes to wait and accommodate those arriving late. So I think that's your startup time. What does sure. engagement look like during that time? Yeah, so, so students, like I said, when they come in, they go to, they go to their startup period. And really I, that schedule that you saw, they really have different activities depending on which day it is. Um, but we really talked about, we want our students to have a positive start to the school day. Um, one thing that we've added in this year is we are meeting, the administrators are meeting students at the door that are coming in late. We just started that this semester. Um, I think maybe, I'm sure your, your schools have felt the impact on attendance this year um, that, you know, at least in our school, it was just the, the um, high levels be of, you know, and, and a lot of it was COVID related, but the high levels of absenteeism. Um, that was happening this year. And so we have started to really meet those students at the door and find out a little bit more about why they're coming in late. And I work with, I worked with sixth graders starting second semester. And so all the sixth grade students would come to me and we were able to work with them, maybe go in, make a phone call, have a conference a little bit, um, and then get them into that startup. But startups really, we have a schedule for it. The teachers put out a, we have a, a teacher that, that creates a PowerPoint for the day, for the entire week. And so teachers can literally file full that PowerPoint on the different activities for, for the week. It really kind of depends on the day, but typically Mondays we start off with my video um, and some team building activities and some things like that for the week. Great, JJ. Well, it's been a pleasure um, hearing from you today and learning a little bit more about what Santa Fe Trail Middle School is doing to empower all students to become engaged learners who explore. So thank you for sharing. Um, I did a final call for questions and I haven't seen uh, any more uh, enter the chat. So we'll go ahead and use this opportunity to transition to our next panelist. So uh, thank you again, JJ, for sharing and to anyone uh, who's, who's joined. Uh, this session, we are hearing from some redesigned schools talking about the innovations that they've implemented these last three years through the redesign initiative. So our next panelist is Leroy Parks. He comes from uh, Wichita 259 Chester Lewis Alternative School. They were part of our Gemini 2 cohort, so our first group of schools to go through regional training. Their vision is to create a positive learning environment in their school. They have focused on decreasing student referrals and increasing their graduation rates. One thing I've really appreciated about Leroy is the intentionality that he puts into building community and culture in his school with his staff. One phrase that I took from him this year that has now become my, my go-to phrase is, if we meet, we eat. Uh, we have fully adopted that on our team as well. Um, and I can, I can tell you with, with certainty, it works in building community and culture. So I know that there's a lot more happening at Chester Lewis than uh, community development with staff. And so Libra, I will turn it over to you to let us in on more uh, work happening in your building. Thank you for that introduction, Sarah. We do uh, do more than just eat at Chester Lewis. Um, alternative school. Um, thank you for having me. Um, and, and JJ, it's always good to see you, brother. I'll see you next week. Um, I'm, I would like to say that I'm sorry about North Carolina, but I'm really not. Um, but we'll get some barbecue in. So obviously humor is something that I, that I uh, love to, to share. So um, I uh, am going to talk about connecting students through advocacy. Um, 
and I'm just going to kind of go through. Um, I, I, uh, I I put together a little presentation uh, for our board not too long ago. So there's some slides here, and I, I I will apologize up front, but also hopefully at the end Sarah can can give my information as well for anybody that wants this uh, because I packed a lot in here, but I'll talk fast because I thought. You know, I had 20 minutes and like JJ has mentioned already, we JJ and I have a competition going on talking. So um, I might uh, outdo him here, but I'll try to be engaging. But um, so the overview, um, I want to kind of talk about our our mission and vision, our motto, uh, our redesign um, and our focus on homeroom and or advocacy, as some of you may call it. We call it homeroom and then the orientation process and then our, our uh, student ambassadors um, at Chester Lewis. So. Um, our mission is to empower all students. Sarah kind of read that. Um, and as part of the redesign, um, and, and JJ uh, tiptoed around this, the, uh, the, 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 the opportunity to, to redesign without any money, um, is uh, uh, we went through the, the entire process again. So we came out with a, a mission statement and a vision statement um, as, far, uh, as far as redesign of what we want to do at Chester Lewis. Um, and very quickly, as a result of that, um, in, a, in a nutshell, we boil down to that we are their why. We mean, obviously, being the teachers and staff at Cheshire Lewis, uh, their why, meaning the, the students. Um, a little bit about Cheshire Lewis, we, um, we're the only alternative option in Wichita. Wichita has about 50,000 students, uh, 100 or so buildings or whatnot. Um, we are a 9 through 12 high school. Um, we are we operate on a nine to four schedule. So for a lot of people, that's an elementary schedule, if we, if we will. But uh, it, looking at research, you know, when trying to given the opportunity with the redesign, we changed our schedule to better accommodate um, high school students as we saw fit. Um, all of our students apply to come to Chester Lewis, so it's an application process. Um, we have about 150 to 175 kids on campus and then we have uh, an, a, what I call a silo site out at one of our malls in partnership with Simon Youth Foundation. Uh, and we have about 350 kids out there. Um, and so we are there why um, as, as part of the redesign, we, we started talking about like, how can we change that a little bit and, and be more casual? Uh, and so what morphed out of that was that we care, um, which is to be welcoming, engaging, uh, compassion, accountability, respect, and excellence. Um, and Sarah, I'll, I'll kind of, I got two screens going. So I'll, if I'm doing this, I'm looking over at you. So you can tell me up or down and slow down because of my talking. So the Gemini 2 redesign. So um, Sarah talked about the, the training, the training that we, uh, it's, uh, I think we were one of the first groups to go through the training where the state came out and supported us. And as a result of the activities and things that we did uh, with the team that went to that training, um, we developed these how might we statements. And um, I'm just going to focus on a couple for, for today's purposes. Um, but it was how might we teach and support emotional growth and how might we develop flexibility in our classes while maintaining accountability. Um, so uh, you'll see a lot on this slide. I'm not going to talk about everything and just hone in on a couple, but um, out of the how might we teach uh, and support emotional growth, one of the things, if you look at that top bullet, we talk about utilizing capturing kids' hearts training as a means of engagement and strategies to engage with our students. Um, and so we honed in on that. Uh, and then the second bullet talked about daily homeroom for students. Uh, and, and I like what JJ offered there also. Um, and so we, because prior to that, we had a pretty standard seven period day. Um, and so as a result of that, uh, that schedule change, we, we decided to talk about uh, our focus on how might we use that homeroom time or use that uh, time every day. Um, and, and some of the things that came out of that um, and JJ mentioned this also, is utilizing Zello, but individual plans of study, um, and also giving students uh, an opportunity to, uh, or teacher advocates to, to really become advocates for the students that they have in their home room. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna really nail that down here in a little bit. Um, and so our master schedule had to change to include homeroom for advocacy. So that was a big change for us 
uh, was, was incorporating uh, homeroom and or advocacy uh, every day, because prior to that, that we, we didn't have that. Um, we also formulated some, some what we call packs. We're the Timberwolves, um, and so I, I play up on that. Um, and so we formulated packs, uh, which are groups of advocacy rooms or homerooms. And so those teacher advocates develop packs with their students. And so we do a lot with that that I'll, I'll speak on in a little um, so the Capturing Kids Hearts training is uh, by the Flipping Group, um, and it's uh, probably its main focus is to increase re relational capacity, um, and they have a strategy that's called the Excel model, and we do everything through that, and I'll expound on that uh, here just, just shortly. Uh, but one of the things that we wanted to really focus on is how we could do that or utilize um, engagement and looking at building uh, relational capacity and truly changing our culture through homeroom uh, and the teacher advocate, and some of the strategies you see you see listed there: greetings and affirmations, and uh, launches that I'll talk about. Um, social contracts. I won't go into that, but they they are different than classroom norms. Um, and then utilizing the the CKH design lessons weekly through homeroom, and I'm going to show you an example of that. So the Excel model um, is. Uh, in its infancy, talks about uh, it's a it's a relationship, leadership, and teaching model. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this again, folks. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll share this with you later, but I think it's important uh, to lay the foundation. But we try to incorporate the Excel strategy in everything that we do at Chester Lewis. So meeting and greeting, uh, discovering individual needs. Um, uh, the communication aspect of it, empowering uh, not only teaching uh, teachers, but students uh, to, to be, and then a meaningful end and seeing with the launch. And this, uh, this occurs throughout our building, in our office, in our hallways. Um, uh, I, I'm of the belief that two people should not cross in the hallway uh, and not, you know, acknowledge one another. Um, and so it's not uncommon uh, for a student, if you were to, to be walking uh, down the, the hallway at Chester Lewis for a student, any student, teacher, custodian, any staff member to engage with you and try to meet your new explore. How can I help you? That type of thing. Really going about changing a culture. Um, so that is, oh, sorry. Uh, that is something that's very important. So I talked about homeroom and our SEL curriculum is, is, is embedded through that. And we have character traits each month. Um, and so this is just an example of, of what we try to do there. Uh, and our goal is to model this, to, to empower to use uh, strategies uh, in their core content uh, that are modeled in advocacy or in homeroom. Um, some other things that are mentioned there, we give a monthly award for character traits. The teachers nominate students. Uh, they get a personalized note from me. Um, and also uh, they get a certificate. It's, it's displayed in the hallway for the month with their pictures. Um, and then I call them to the office for school-wide recognition over the all call. Um, and then I also take and send an, an individual letter home to, to the parents of each one of the students uh, because, um, you know, att attendance letters and 357 and, you know, discipline referral letters, you know, I, I, I really wanted to uh, uh, send something positive home uh, that, hey, your kid was recognized for in the month of January for respect. And this is what your teacher had to say about your student. So when the teachers, they, the teachers send the referral to me, uh, and I'm, I'm going to power through, I promise, um, I take and, and, and copy and paste what the teacher said, and I embed that into the letter that I mail home, um, along with my other notes. And, and so we send those out every month. And all of that, again, is done through homeroom. So here's our schedule, um, and you can see I kind of highlighted fourth hour is our day is our uh, homeroom. Um, JJ made some 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 great um, uh, comments about you know attendance and things and kids arriving late um, and and those type of things. We we felt it was important that everyone got uh, our students uh, got homeroom. So um, after discussion with staff, uh, we we decided to make it our fourth hour right before lunch. And kind of like JJ's flex scheduling, sometimes we'll pack um, an, uh, an activity or something in fourth hour that can bleed over into lunch. Um, and so we, we utilize that time kind of flex that uh, we flex that time 
uh, there during fourth hour. Um, and, and I'm sure you've probably looked at, you know, some of the things that we do, the, the restorative practice, trauma assistance curriculum, IPS, clubs and organizations, all of that runs through our homeroom. Um, and I want to highlight real quick before I move on that homeroom is the lifeline for our students this, uh, this school year is another presentation. And the expectation as advocates is that you take personal responsibility for each kid assigned to you. This is how I started out the school year last year um, to, with, the, with staff that if I were to check on a kid or whatnot, I'm going to come to the staff member of the, that has that student in their homeroom. Um, and they should know everything about that kid, why that kid's late, or if he's been sick, if he had surgery, when his birthday is, uh, things, things of that nature. And so the, the culture, uh, the relational capacity culture is important. We, we know that if a student can connect with one adult at school, uh, then we've got a chance or an opportunity. And so I really hone in on that with, with staff. And, there, and I will say that there are set staff that are not comfortable with that because they are not naturally relational uh, people. And that's where the strategy of the Excel model comes in. So very quickly, this is what our homeroom structure looks like. Uh, on Monday, we have win back day, which is kind of like a study hall. On Tuesday is when we do our social emotional work, our, our neurologic, our capturing kids heart strategies, and our social worker kind of leads that. Uh, the individual plans of study, uh, Amy Alvarez is our college and career coordinator. So we do our Zello work, our college and career readiness and prep and things of that nature. That occurs on Wednesdays. Uh, and then Taco About Your Future, SEL, our school counselor, um, we use uh, that day on Thursdays uh, to do our social emotional learning work. And then on Fridays, we have what we call club days. Um, every teacher signs up uh, for a club to lead a club, uh, including myself. Um, and then we let the, uh, over a couple of weeks, we allow the kids to sign up. And then um, the kids go to clubs on those days. Um, and clubs could be anything from knitting, um, games. Uh, we have game design and um, all kind of crap going on. I mean, club Fridays are pretty fun. Um, I led uh, uh, a group of young men, uh, particularly African-American young men, uh, and talked with them about leadership, as an example, and uh, presentation and th things of that nature. And then the club cycle rotates every nine weeks. So the, the teachers then will, uh, kids can either sign up for a different club uh, or they can keep the same club um, or, you know, in some cases the clubs change, but every nine weeks we, we rotate that out. Um, so this talks about- Hey, Leroy. Work. Yes. Quick, quick question um, about homeroom. How many students are in each homeroom? Between 15 to 18 students. Perfect, thanks. I'll let you keep going. Okay, thanks. Uh, sweat. Okay, so our wolf packs. Um, the goal of, of of the packs is to build that school community or that school culture, um, if you will. Um, and so it talks about um, our chat challenges. So um, we uh, we do um, um, every nine weeks we'll do a chat challenge. Um, and so the last one we done we did in the spring was a. Uh, um, oh, the freaking uh, amazing race. We did like an amazing race. And so the groups were all, the kids were all partnered together and they had these activities to, uh, to go around the building and out, out on campus and, and do certain things. And then they came back and we had a big awards assembly at the end as, as, as an example. Uh, but every nine weeks we do a different check challenge. Um, our bag assemblies, I call them bag behavior attendance and grades. Those occur every nine weeks also. So kids have an opportunity uh, to get recognized for uh, attendance or raising their academics. We, uh, we're credit driven because we're a high school. And so uh, I didn't talk about that. And so credits are real important uh, around there. So if a kid uh, got you know one and a half credits in the nine weeks or something, we, we find opportunities to, to celebrate. And most generally everyone gets, every, uh, uh, gets a, some type of award, but we do the bag assemblies uh, every nine weeks. Um, ooh, this is just an example of the homeroom syllabus. Um, so um, it does have a course number. And so kids do, it is graded. Um, and so I know it's probably, there's a lot on there and you probably can't see it, but uh, the kids are graded and each day is, is roughly five points. Um, 
uh, and if they are participating um, and, and, and participating in the activities over the course of the different day. So um, I just wanted to share with you all that, that we do have, and this syllabus is provided for all of the homeroom teachers. Um, we have a group or a committee of teachers that, that work on this, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so the teachers in, in general, uh, my staff do not have to worry about uh, planning or creating the syllabus. It's all planned for them. I have a group that works on that. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, so how do we put all this together? There's a weekly email that goes out by one of my teachers on Thursdays for the next week. Um, and within that, as you'll see, it has the lesson plans, the announcements that's going to occur, usually from me, uh, the grading structure, the roster, any school announcement. And our committee meets every other Monday. The committee that puts all this together meets every other Monday during their teacher plan time. Um, and they do receive a supplemental for this work. Um, we have a year-long planning document. And uh, we're, a, we're a Microsoft district, so that Teams file, there's a Microsoft team. Um, and so all the files are located there. This is just an example of the email that goes out from Ryan. And you, and you can see that it has all of the attachments in there. Um, he sends it out every Thursday religiously. So the teachers all know it's going to come on Thursday to get ready for the following week. Um, and so, again, just a, another example of the agenda. So you can see that this is uh, the week of or week number 26. It uh, looks like February. Um, the teachers kind of get that. Uh, I'm a paper type guy. I know. I know for you young people, 30 years uh, in this business and, you know, uh, I'm not digital yet. Um, so. Um, and then I'm just going through this real quick, guys. Um, this is just an example of uh, the SEL lessons that are script. So I just want to emphasize that the teachers get this on Thursday for the next week. So that gives them a day or two, um, you know, or over the weekend, whatever, to kind of read through and, and, and know what is uh, what they are, are, are supposed to do for the following week. And some of you are probably thinking it, and yes, I do have teachers that get it on the day and they say, well, what are we doing today? So we still got some ground to, to cover on that. Um, and then this is just a, the, an example of the year long, um, we, they plan for the year. This, this group will get together next month um, for a couple of days at the leadership retreat. Uh, and we'll go through and kind of try to plan everything out uh, for the year. I know that's dangerous, um, but I, I, I'm, a, I'm a planner, so I like to uh, uh, have things at least planned out so that we can adjust on the fly if we need to. So um, just a few more slides here, and then I'll, I'll entertain some questions. I've come to, this is a, I'm a quote person also. Um, and so I shared this with, with staff to, to, to really drive home the point that, that they, the teachers matter, that they have the power uh, to make a child's life miserable or joyous. Um, um, and so humanizing or the culture aspect of things is very, very important uh, to me. Uh, and so as a result of this, we saw a need for orientation. How are kids, how are we setting kids up for success at Chester Lewis when they come from all over our district? We, uh, we're the only school that does that. So um, in order to do that, um, we developed an orientation process just, just this past year, um, and this may strike some of you, uh, but uh, teachers uh, 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 were, were okay with this. Um, but when a student comes to Chester Lewis, they uh, you'll see the purple highlighted. They're with their homeroom teacher um, for the whole day. Um, so when a, uh, I mentioned that we're an alternative school, so we may have students that, that arrive to our school middle, middle of September, uh, October. These kids, uh, I, I call it, we hemorrhage kids. I mean, kids just kind of come to us from different schools. So we are always in the process of orienting kids to our school. So we wanted to streamline this. Um, if you'll see on the left there, it says, it takes one to two days for them to work through the materials. And above that, it says they get a quarter credit. So this is the first, credit that a kid gets at Cheshire Lewis, and they can get that within the first day or two. Um, it is somewhat self-guided with the systems, but I want to go back up, back up and say, but when a kid comes new to our building, they start with that homeroom advocate, and they are with that homeroom advocate until they complete this. 
Um, and so I thought I might get some pushback on this, but um, I think hopefully you'll uh, staff kind of accepted it to a certain extent, because again, they are the first point of contact for the student. And so homeroom, they, a student needs to, uh, to feel welcomed and be um, encouraged and, and comfortable. Um, and the teacher advocate has to be the one to do that. I just believe that. Um, so how is this organized? We have a SharePoint website um, that uh, houses all of this um, and a workbook that the students get. Um, and then this is just an example you'll see across the top, module one, module two, module three. So there are seven modules. Uh, the student then gets um, their packet and they, I said it's self-guided. So there's some, some self-guided that goes through it. There's some videos for me. Uh, you'll see on policy quiz, there's things that we have built on the website for the, on the SharePoint site for the student to work through as, the, as they're in the homeroom teacher's room so that the homeroom teacher doesn't have to turn and help little Leroy. And then they can still go through their lessons and, and most of this is self-guided. Um, but I also want the teacher, the homeroom teacher to be able to facilitate for that kid uh, once completion, um, and once they complete it, uh, midday, right after lunch or whatnot, then they're launched into their classes. There's an email that goes out to the whole staff, hey, Leroy passes orientation, um, welcome him to your sixth hour. So that was a, that was a big change for us this year. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is our ambassador program, uh, which is our student leaders uh, program. Um, we, uh, when a student comes to Chester Lewis, um, you'll see that first bullet. We have students take them on a student tour. Um, I don't do it or our counselor doesn't do it. Um, but our student leaders uh, that we train have a checklist of things that they're supposed to go through. And this is what an example you're seeing here. So this is actually a handout that the student leader takes with them with the student. And our student leader takes them around. Um, and points of interest, you can see all that on there. Um, we also ask our student leaders to reconnect with that new student at lunch. So, because typically they don't know anybody. Um, and so uh, our ambassadors do a great job of going out and sitting with that kid in the cafeteria that's new to the school and, hey, how's your day going, that type of thing. Um, and all of that goes towards building the relational capacity at Chester Lewis. Um, I'll end with some data. Um, and 1819 or 1920 was actually the, the last year, um, you know, before the, the, world, the, the whole world went to hell. So, uh, or, or, um, so we had 270 incidents, um, and then you know the repeating incidents. And as of the the, the the end of this year, we were down to 67. Um, and so um, I say that because uh, we also had our best academic year as far as credits. Um, we had 37 kids, uh, or we had 42 kids um, that were seniors with us, um, and 37 of that 40 graduate uh, of that 42, 37 of the 42 graduated on time, uh, and that other five are in summer school right now. We have a summer graduation, uh, and three of that five have already graduated, and the other two will make it by June 23rd. Um, and so. Um, I'm saying this to say that I believe that culture matters and I believe that culture um, um, in a building, um, in our advocacy, in our homeroom uh, matters. Whoa. Uh, and none of this would have been possible without the opportunity to go back and truly redesign and, and strip down, if you will, to the bare bones of how we'd always done, always done things to how we do things now. Um, and so, um, last slide is how do we measure success? Um, and I, I measure success with student feedback. And we had uh, three different students. One said, I've never had a school ask me how I learn best. Uh, one student said, thank you for giving me time and space to get comfortable before going to work. Uh, and then uh, the last one, I've never had a school care this much about me. Um, and so that's kind of my presentation on how we do advocacy. I know I've blitzed through that pretty quick. And there's probably some we questions um, and uh, that I would be happy to try and answer. Uh, but uh, Sarah, if you'll put my information, it's probably easier for me to send this to you all and my, my contact information as well. Uh, so uh, that's all I got. Thank you so much, Leroy.
Um, and to our panelists, feel free to put your contact information in the chat. Um, I'm also happy to coordinate uh, that communication as well. Um, one thing I, I wanted to highlight from your presentation, Leroy, was how your team was able to use those how might we questions, those driving questions that a lot of times might drive up a, a PBL, which really redesign is that PBL for our educators. And so having that big question that you were able to, to leverage and knowing that that 2018-19 school year was your plan year and to see where you've come since then is, is really remarkable. Um, one question that came up in the chat around uh, clubs and exploration time and things like that was, um, how are you engaging parents, community, business um, in, in that time? So uh, good question. So every once a quarter, um, we have um, one, one quarter we did a chili feed. Um, and so we design, it was designed on a Friday. Uh, we invited community members and parents to come in uh, and, and, and participate with that. We have uh, <laughs> Louis Palooza. And um, I wish I knew who was out there, but wish people knew my sense of humor, Sarah. So I'm a little uncomfortable, but we have Louis Palooza, uh, which is an, an art show, an art exhibit uh, gallery that we do in conjunction with Wichita State University, where some of our pottery students and art students um, display their art. And we have a talent show and things of that nature to go along with that. And we invite community members to come in um, and, and be a part of that. So um, we certainly have some work to do in that area as far as being intentional about getting community and, 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 and parents in, but we have designated activities once a quarter to get folks in on the regular. One of the things that uh, I'm working on or have been working on is a mentorship uh, and, and giving students opportunities to go out and do internships and things of that nature and, and working with my college and career coordinator. So uh, we're going to launch, uh, you know, the, the uh, I haven't come up with some clever acronym yet, uh, but we're going to turn our pack loose on the community uh, for a day on one of our days for students, all students, the whole school to go out on a day uh, and, and be partnered up uh, for internships with a doctor, lawyer, nurse, whatever. Um, and so we're, we're, we're going to try it this, this fall um, and see how that goes uh, and give the students uh, an opportunity to get some credit for that also. Um, and so we're, that's a long winded answer saying we're trying, uh, we're, we're looking at ways to try to get things, uh, the community involved, uh, but we, we certainly uh, have a ways to go in that, but uh, we're trying some things. Thanks for sharing, Leroy. Another question that um, popped up was around um, homeroom time. A lot of schools are using that time for intervention, MTSS, uh, knowing that you guys have really structured that time differently. When um, are you um, building that MTSS, that intervention time into your day, if, if not during homeroom? It, it is during homeroom time. Um, we do do that for, for certain kids, um, and that's on the win back days. Uh, or if a student needs to be, uh, let's say, some, some additional um, uh, support in English or uh, in that regard, one of the things that, that is cool about our school is that um, the, the flexibility we have within our schedule. So it's not uncommon for uh, a teacher, my English teacher, to keep a kid uh, in her English class or his English class and contact um, the science teacher who the kid is supposed to have next, uh, and then they will trade out the following day if, you, if you're following what I'm saying. So um, we do that within the school day. We do do um, some, uh, some of that work on the win back days. Um, but one thing that I was uh, adamant about is that club days, uh, now, now club days we, we do um, um, usually every other Friday, um, um, it just kind of depends on the club and on those odd Fridays, uh, we can have some time for intervention there. But it was important to me that kids got an opportunity uh, to get involved in a club and to get involved in, in, in that type of thing be, uh, uh, because it was important to me. I'll put it that way. I think they need opportunities to, to, to do some things out, outside the box. That's great. Thanks for sharing, Leroy. Um, I put a call for final questions in the chat. I haven't seen any new ones um, pop up there yet. Um, but I think that last quote that you shared is just a really great thing to end with of 
just how deeply your, your school cares about each student. Um, and I think the fact that students are able to attest to that really shows to the work that you and your team have, have done uh, at Chester Lewis. So big kudos to you and thank you so much for sharing. I've seen lots of emails come in the chat. I'll save that before we exit today um, and, and make sure to share presentations uh, with folks as well. So uh, thanks, thanks Leroy. And I'm gonna transition us over to Jared, our last panelist of the day. Uh, we're really excited to have him here from uh, Baser Linwood High School. They are part of our Gemini One cohort. Uh, so some of those first schools to, to volunteer and work through that redesign plan year. They've really strived to empower, engage, and encourage all Bobcats of tomorrow. Uh, they've focused a lot on individual plans of study, personalized learning, post-secondary success, um, and I think one thing that I really appreciated about Jared and the work that they've done uh, at Baser Linwood High School uh, really stems from their community partnerships and empowering teachers to lead. So I'm really excited for all of you to hear from Jared about the work that they have done in Baser. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. I, uh, I, this is a hard, th these are two hard people to follow, uh, JJ and Leroy. You guys are doing some pretty amazing things. and. Um, but, uh, it also, I, I'm sitting here writing notes of things that I forgot that I want to make sure I share as we go through here. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our innovation Academy and kind of our redesign process, uh, just briefly, you know, base for Linwood for, for those of you that don't know, you know, we're, we're right up here in next to KCK, uh, not too far from Lawrence, right down the, the street, um, five, a high school and, you know, one of our biggest challenges is we're one of the fastest growing districts in the state of Kansas. I believe we're still in the top two uh, or top three, um, you know, and we're, we're at about 850 kids and, and just continuing to, to grow and, and getting more and more uh, diversity and more families uh, and continuing to change. And so a, a little bit about our timeline, um, in 17, 18, you know, and really even before that, we started to uh, uh, look at, so we had a lots of community focus groups. Uh, we spent a lot of time with uh, incorporating our community, uh, working with KSDE, partnering with outside organizations. Uh, we, we originally part, partnered with uh, Startland and they um, is an organization there in, in Kansas City that, that used the uh, design thinking method. And if you're not familiar with the design thinking method, we use that for everything here at the high school. Um, and it's really something that has opened up our uh, eyes and opportunities through that. Uh, we launched in 1920 um, and Innovation Academy, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but you know, it's, it's student-led, facilitator-supported, project-focused, so we talk a lot about student choice. Um, and then in the last three years, we've really worked on expanding that. Uh, this year, we added a ninth grade model. Uh, next year, we're adding a sophomore model, um, really client-focused. We had the opportunity to, uh, to be a part of the, the Kauffman Foundation, the Real World Learning uh, Cohort. Um, so I, I, I believe JJ might, you guys might be a part of that also. And, you know, if you, if you have an opportunity to see that we're the, we're the, the squeaky wheel, we're the little asterisks at the bottom of their presentation. We're actually outside of the, uh, uh, six County realm, but, uh, you know, and I'll talk here in a minute. Sometimes you have to be that squeaky wheel, uh, to, uh, to continue to get some of those things. And so. Really, as we grow and expand, uh, like I said, we're adding uh, an additional model um, next year. So really how we started, uh, you know, here at, at Baser is I think, I think we really had to take a kind of a, reflect, a reflection piece for us. Uh, you know, we had pretty decent test scores. We had, you know, everybody, oh, Baser, they're so good. You know, athletics, really doing well. And, and kind of had to take a step back and realize that, um, maybe we weren't doing as well as we thought. And I think that uh, redesign really gave us that opportunity to, to do something different and really think about what school should look like. And so our, our why is every student will find their why. And so as we talk about this, uh, as I talk through this Innovation Academy, it's, 
it's very student driven. Uh, students have a, a ton of choice, uh, a ton of flexibility in their schedules um, through this. So just a, a few things as you talk about redesign, I think, and, and this is, you know, not, not just for, for principals, but also for teacher leaders and for all of you on here, you know, I think as you go through this process, you have to really be able to embrace that change. And I think it starts at the top and, and that doesn't mean with me. And I think JJ may have said that, you know, it doesn't necessarily start with the, the principal, but finding who those uh, kind of those early adopters are and uh, letting them go. And I think sometimes in education, we set up all these, or a lot of times maybe, we set up all these barriers that, well, we can't do this, we can't do that. Um, and I think we, we get in our own way. And so I think we have to stop standing in the way sometimes and um, get out of the way. <laughs> Uh, you know, and also as we went through this, you know, we started this process with early adopters. We had 10 teachers that really took uh, kind of charge of this. And we didn't, as we built this academy, we didn't force anyone to be a part of this. You know, as we start to, as you start to change, you have people that are on the bus pretty quickly and people that are kind of hesitant to get on the bus. Um, and, <clears throat> and I think you know, it starts with those people, but also as we've built the system, um, and I say system loosely because our system changes every day. I mean, we're continuing to fly the plane and build it at the same time. And I can tell you, I had lots of teachers in multiple meetings that roll their eyes and roll their head when I say that again. They're like, oh, Jared's on this again. He's, we're gonna do something different. Um, but I think, the cool part about that is, is that, you know, if, if you're going to, if you build it, they will come. Everybody, everybody's seen that movie, you know, and I think we've, we're to the point now, four or five years later, where like, that's what we do here. It's not a, this group over here and this group over here. Um, and I think you just have to continue to ask why not. Um, you know, when you, you come up with barriers and, well, we can't do this or we can't do that. And I think it's, uh, it's why, why can't we do that? Because I think in education, there's a lot of things in Kansas that we can do um, that we don't do because it's hard or because we haven't got permission to do it. Um, and so these are our guiding principles and they, they play along, I feel like pretty closely with uh, the redesign of principles. You know, we, we strive to really embrace the unknown um, and that understanding that learning is about the process, not the product. Um, we give a lot of student choice. Um, as we started this process, we did start with seniors, which I will say was probably the safe group, to, the safest group to start with. Uh, this year we threw in freshmen and, and that, was, uh, that was a challenge, but it, it, it could not have gone better. Uh, one of the other principles that we really focus on is it's okay to fail. And we talk about failing fast. Um, so, and, and I think this really is something that our teachers um, have taken a hold on that, um, you know, they're willing to try some different things outside of the box. And I think giving them permission to do that has been uh, a huge piece of, of what we're doing here. And then the last piece is the community partnerships. And I'll talk a lot more about that. That's something that our community and our city here, specifically the city of Baser, has uh, wrapped their arms around what we're doing here at the high school. Uh, if you've ever been to Baser, you know, we're, we're, it's Baser Linwood, so we've got two towns. There's no downtown to, uh, to Baser. Uh, we, have a, we have a Casey's, we have a Dollar General, and we have a, a Subway. Um, and oh, we, I guess we got a Daylight Donuts not too long ago. So there isn't a whole lot here. It's the school. And so I think that um, community partnerships have been just huge for our kids and for our teachers. Um, so some of the things that we focus on again, and I know Sarah mentioned these earlier through our Innovation Academy, and then I'll, I'll get a little bit into the weeds of what, what this means, but a lot of personalized learning. So students um, get a lot of choice. It's all project-based. Um, so you're not gonna see a lot of uh, kids in, in classes uh, receiving direct instruction. There is some, but a lot of this is all personalized. Uh, one of our goals, and I'll, I'll show you a uh, an 
comments here in a minute is, is we're really connecting the core and the CTE. Uh, there's some really fantastic um, organizations out there. If you're familiar with Blue Valley Caps and uh, Lawrence has a great um, career center, um, you know, a lot of those technical schools and the focus of those, and it's fantastic, is a lot of the CTE stuff. And so our goal here is to connect the core and the CTE and really um, engage those kids. And I think when we went all the way back and we started that reflection on why we're doing redesign, it really had to do with engagement. You know, our kids weren't as engaged and um, weren't uh, bought in as much as maybe we thought they were. And then community partnerships, uh, real world problem solving, so there, there are very few, if zero projects that we take on that aren't real world and don't have actual uh, meaning uh, to people in our community or to our kids. Um, and our kids that are in that program, they, they know the design thinking process like the back of their hand because they use it for everything. And it, there's nothing cooler to see a kid really understand what empathizing means and to really understand how they can, any situation, be able to to empathize with that. The other thing is it allowed us to flexible scheduling um, for our kids um, through that, you know, at our, our school our, we're on a alternating block schedule. So we have 85 minute class periods. Um, so it's either a green day or a gold day. And really this allowed our kids that were in classes such as uh, band or choir or things that aren't offered multiple times during the day, this allowed a lot of flexibility for those kids. Um, and it also opened up the possibility for more of the internships and, and all those pieces. So this is kind of the graphic that I wanted to show you guys. And as you look through traditional classrooms, you know, you have four, you have your government, your science, your English, maybe a CTE class, and, and you're talking and you're focused on project-based. Uh, learning. Well, typically you're, you might have four different problem statements. So a kid's doing four different projects and a lot of times there's no connection between those four projects. So our goal through the Innovation Academy was we're going to have one project and one problem statement and we're going to connect it to multiple disciplines, um, which is which is really, really cool. So just one example, and I'll, I'll talk about a few of these, you know, we had a um, we had a student that was interested in going into physics. And so she was able to this was a couple of years ago, she, we have a, a business here in town, it's a restorative aircraft uh, p uh, business, and they work on airplane wings. Um, I, I can't even begin to know where those go or, or what exactly they do, but they restore aircraft uh, wings. And so this student was able to, through the Innovation Academy and through the flexibility, she actually spent half her day um, there. And um, that, basic, that person was basically her teacher uh, for physics. And so she was able to go learn how to do uh, put those uh, airplane wings together and learn some ins and outs. And then she would come back and connect with our physics teacher uh, and seeing what standards she was able to meet through that experience out in the community. Um, and, and not only did she receive a physics credit uh, through that experience, but she was also able to um, get a project management credit um, and I believe there was one more credit that she was able to, to get. So through one project, she got three different credits um, and she didn't really sit in a classroom at all. And so I think those experiences and those connections are um, pretty, uh, pretty amazing. So this is a little bit what our program looks like and I'm gonna really get into the Emerge. So really we started with the Innovate, that's where we started. So we started a little bit backwards. Um, so the Innovate was really, like I said, we started with 12th graders. Um, this year we had uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors in that Innovate. Um, and that includes, you know, internships. We have two student-run businesses in our building. We have a coffee shop, that's the Den, and then we have Green and Gold, which does apparel. Um, you know, industry credentials, client-connected projects. Uh, we had a group that um, 
built a tiny home like a playhouse and they uh, took that playhouse and entered it into a um, down at the Union Station. So the Kansas City Builders, our Home Builders Association had a, uh, uh, oh, uh, what am I thinking? A, uh, some kind of competition where you could enter in this and then they would auction these off. Um, and our students won. Uh, I wish I had some pictures I would share of that, but I think their, their playhouse sold for uh, like over a thousand dollars. And then it was uh, donated to um, a local organization. And through that project, those kids got, uh, we had all sorts of difference. They got uh, um, a, they all get a project management credit. And then uh, one of the kids got a, uh, like an industrial tech, cause they did a lot of the weld, there was welding they had to do. They had to, you know, we had a community member come in and work with them to build the playhouse. Um, and it was, it was really, really cool. So the Innovate is really student led. The students choose their projects. So the facilitator supports. Um, we have over 20 courses that kids can get credit uh, through the Innovate and I'll pull those up in a minute. And then somebody had asked a question about community partnerships. In, in the uh, Innovate, every single one of those kids has to have a community partner um, for their projects. Uh, we can, they may be able to find someone or we connect them with someone, um, but that is a, vital part to that. Uh, uh, this year we were able to start, uh, we opened up Emerge. So I think one thing that we found over the last couple of years is that uh, the Innovation Academy is not necessarily, it wasn't for freshmen or the Innovate <laughs> was not for freshmen as they come in and we're not doing a ton of that in our middle school, which is probably the, the next step. But, um, and so there was a gap. So what do we do with kids that um, are coming in as freshmen and how do we, um, you know, introduce them to the design thinking method and some of the things that we do here at the high school. And so we created what we called Emerge. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you, we really didn't know what we were doing when we created this uh, last year. We put on the uh, enrollment cards as those kids enrolled as eighth graders. Uh, Basically, there was a little line that said, if you're interested in learning differently, check this box. And that's basically all we said uh, to those eighth graders. And, and we had over a hundred kids that checked that box uh, coming up to the high school. And well, one problem was we didn't have, we didn't have uh, people to teach all of those hundred kids. So unfortunately we did have to limit it. So we kind of went through and uh, limited that to 40 uh, students this year that were in that emerge, we will be able to have, I think we'll have a hundred next year. So we were able to shift some things in our schedule and offer a couple blocks, you know, with ninth graders, sometimes they need a lot, a little bit more structure. Um, and, you know, this is a cross curricular. So this year we took in first semester and I'll, I'll show this slide here in a minute, you know, first semester, we had an English teacher and a social studies teacher and they had 40 kids and they taught it together, co-curricular. So they took a fourth block every day, um, co-taught. Um, it's a project-based client connected. So I'll, I'll show you that this is probably the, one of the coolest things I think we've ever done here. We connected with our city and um, we're able to do a, a, a project with the city. Second semester, we had a um, our engineering teacher and our business teacher and so uh, kids were able to get a, um, a business essentials credit and a intro to STEAM credit. And first semester, they got an English and a uh, civics credit. Um, next year, next year, we're going to add Ignite. So this is 10th and 11th graders. So we will have the full uh, gamut of our Innovation Academy um, next year. And so the facilitators will be a little bit more involved in this. They're gonna give, help them with projects. Um, it's gonna be a little bit more collaborative uh, content. There's gonna be smaller groups, project development, independent work. Um, so a little bit more facilitator led before we get into the uh, Innovate. Um, here's our list of courses that students can get. Um, and all of these courses, I, I will tell you, are all through uh, really complex 
competency based and mastery based. So when they're done, they're done. So they can get through those. They have checklists as we go through. Um, and we're continuing to add courses if we can. Um, the cool thing was, as you go through this, you know, when we started, we had four teachers that are uh, were involved in this. In the last two years, we've been able to, uh, because it's been so successful, we added a innovation specialist who leads our um, innovation academy. And next year, we talked to our superintendent into adding a English teacher. So we will have a full-time innovation academy English teacher, um, which is which is pretty awesome. So just a few more specifics, and this is this gets in the weeds a little bit, and this can get a little confusing. Um, our students in, in IA had to enroll in two blocks, um, and this is the innovate uh, piece. Um, one block they got project management, the other block was really their choice. So it depends on what their project was. Um, and, and the crazy, th the, the cool thing is, is when kids enroll, you know, when we, when kids go, and, and I will tell you, our counselors have a little bit of a panic attack when, when we start talking to them about IA because it's, it's a little bit complicated. But when they enroll, they enroll in Innovation Academy. At the end of the year, uh, depending on what course they were able to connect with their project, on their transcript, it says physics, or it says government, or it says, you know, project management or business essentials. Um, because they're learning the same thing. They're just learning it differently. I did want to show you this example. Um, this is what our government teacher uses. So this might help make a little bit more sense. So for example, this is how a kid that would take government through Innovation Academy, this is how they earn their credits. So we, we focus here on, in our district on priority standards. So our, our teachers have taken the last three years and really focused on priority and finding out what are those priority standards. So for each of these six standards, there are lots of ways that kids can earn credit. Um, and they have to get, I believe, um, I think out of six credits, I think four of them have to be hit through their project or maybe it's three. So for example, um, the number one priority standard was government foundations. And so they can meet that standard by an artifact from their project. And so they, whatever that artifact is, they have to write a reflection and then they meet with their facilitator um, or the content teacher. And um, the content teacher, just like in a regular classroom, determines whether they have met the um, the standard in order to get credit for that. They have other options. If they can't hit the standards with their project, uh, then there's alternatives. You know, the example would be they have to do a speech or they have to do a National History Day exhibit, or maybe it's a, an exam, maybe it's a written paper. Um, and so there's modules created in Canvas. We use Canvas for our learning management system um, that kids can do that. So they really have multiple ways. Again, student choice, they have multiple ways of earning credit for that class. Our goal, we want them to do that through the project, but I think we know that's not possible for every single standard to be learned through that project. Um, let me see here. This is a quick example of what, our, of what a student schedule might look like. Here's a, there's a lot here, so let's just maybe focus on student one. So we have our green days and our gold days. So these kids, this student um, enrolled in Innovation Academy, Green One, Gold One, and Gold Four. Now note, all three of these kids, student one, two, and three, were all working on the same project. So you might see that they didn't all have necessarily Innovation Academy all at the same time. So some of this, they have to plan out and coordinate this between themselves. So this student, they were able to earn a economics, project management, government, and a strength conditioning. You say, well, how can they earn strength conditioning? Well, sometimes this kid had to take calculus is only offered during green four. Maybe that's the only block they could have taken strength conditioning also. Well, they can organize their time and maybe they do their workouts during gold four and they work on their project gold one. So it's really that organization and that accountability back on the student also to have that flexibility to organize 
their time. Um, uh, I'm going to skip. Go ahead, Sarah. Am I running out of time here? See, I can talk forever. So. Yeah, I want to make sure we have time for questions. So if you could work to the end, that would be great. Okay, I'll see what I can do. See, I, I knew I would talk too long. Um, well, real quickly, here, here's the last thing I'll talk about, a little bit about Emerge. So like I said, first semester, we had two teachers, 40 students, um, exploring social studies and English one. So really our problem statement was how my, our, the city of Baser gave us, and when I say gave us, they really did give us a four acre um, park. And so those students had the opportunity to um, survey community members, survey students. Um, they came up with the name. They determined what types of things are going to be in the park. Um, and then second semester, they um, worked with the city again to plan out community engagement events um, and engineered ways to inform our citizens on upcoming city projects. So we had multiple times uh, during the semester where we had the city doing um, open houses here at the school and the students helped put that on. And so they were able to earn uh, a couple other credits um, along with English second semester. Um, here's just some examples of what our kids came up with with the park. Um, and the engineer took all of these different examples and worked with the kids and uh, the park is supposed to break ground, I believe this fall. So it's a, it's a pretty awesome um, opportunity there for our kids. So uh, yeah, so Sarah, I threw a lot of information out there. I'm, I'm sorry, I tried to talk as fast and um, there's, it's, it's uh, I see, always see, whenever I give this presentation, I always see a lot of people looking at me cross-eyed or probably looking past me, like, I don't know what this guy's talking about, but. I will tell you, we, this is open, just a couple quick things to close up. This is for all kids. So it's not, a, it's not just for gifted kids or kids that are excelling. Every single student at Baser Linwood has the opportunity to be a part of IA if they choose to, um, which I think is really cool. And we've seen some, some awesome kids just that maybe don't like school or maybe aren't engaged in school have become just like, this is their thing. And when you ask parents about Baser Linwood, they talk about IA. They say, well, my kid doesn't talk about any other class, but they kind of, they come home and talk about the opportunities and the, the community partnerships that they've made with um, Innovation Academy. So it's, it's been really, really cool. And, and I think it's been exciting and, and really good. And, and that's just kind of, it's become our, I think Leroy mentioned about culture, like that's our culture now, like it's innovation. It's just what we do. And, you know, if, and JJ talked about hiring teachers, when a teacher comes in and says, you know, I like to try things differently or, you know, I'm willing to do this, then that that's that's a good thing. So I'll, I'll be quiet and, and see if there's any questions. <laughs> well, Jared, it was a fantastic presentation and I love to see how you started, you know, with one thing and how it's really grown and scaled across your school and been modified for the grade level. Uh, one question that came in was around your middle school. Uh, so now as your innovation and your PDL focus uh, grows and shifts and it's trickling down to all of those grade levels, uh, what collaboration have you had with the, the middle school to um, bring it down to that level or to prepare students in middle school for what they can expect at the high school? Yeah, so the last couple years, specifically this year, um, we, we take a group of kids and then a couple teachers and we go down to the middle school and we spend a morning uh, with those kids talking about Innovation Academy. Um, you know, part of, our, part of our problem, I'll be honest, is if we had, at this point, if we had too many kids that were interested, I don't know how we would be able to, because we don't have enough staff. So uh, we have to be a little bit careful that we don't sell it too much um, because we're still trying to build that capacity with, uh, with staff. But the cool part is, is we will have over a hundred kids in it next year because we've been able to add um, a couple staff members in the last couple of years because our district seeds the, um, the, the positive uh, reactions of that. So we continue to kind of work through that and potentially move it down to our middle school. Awesome, thanks for, for sharing that. Uh, one kind of technical question that came in was around uh, with that CTE focus. 
Um, is your school using the ACT work keys in any fashion um, or, or attaching that to any uh, credit opportunities? Uh, well, we haven't attached it to any credit opportunities yet. Uh, we do do the work keys. Primarily, we haven't used it as much as I think we probably need to. Um, you know, I, I saw somewhere in the chat earlier about the, our, the JAG-K. You know, we are a JAG-K school, and all of our JAG kids do take the work keys. I'm pretty sure that might be a requirement for them to do that. But um, we hope to really start implementing that a little bit more in the future. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm big on if there are opportunities um, for kids to be awarded credit for things that they have accomplished, then we're going to find a way to do that. Um, and we do. So I, I think yes would be my answer in the future. That's something we hope to do more of. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jared and JJ and Leroy. I uh, heard you all present before, but I always learn something new from you, whether it be a new strategy that you're employing or just learning from your, from your leadership uh, and the example that you're setting here in Kansas. So um, thank you so much uh, for your for your presentations. Thank you, KU and uh, uh, Sherry, for giving us uh, the space and the opportunity to tell this story. Um, and I appreciate the the uh, opportunity to moderate this panel. So Sherry, I'll turn it over to you to close out this panel. But thank you to our presenters um, and for for the, hosting this opportunity. Wow, those were amazing presentations. You all, all three of you are just doing incredible work. And I really, I can't wait to learn more about it. I wanna learn really more about all of these wonderful ways that you are getting students engaged in, in real world projects and connecting learning to their lives. That's exactly what we all need to be doing. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really inspired by this panel. Thank you. So thank you, Sarah, JJ, Leroy, and Jared. That was truly wonderful. Really appreciate the time you spent with us today. Mm -hmm.